Hello, welcome to this presentation on one-dimensional elements. So we're going to look at uh, different ways we can represent uh, one-dimensional elements as we do our modeling. And this will be extended to two-dimensional elements as well. Uh, but we'll start out here to make things a little bit more simple. Uh, as we do our setup for this lecture, uh, you can go to the lecture materials and um, just get the notes. We don't have any MathCAD file for this, and uh, that should get you to where you need to go. All right, so where are we headed? We'll be looking at uh, straight line elements, again, one-dimensional elements, that contain an unknown variable. And for example, if we have a heat transfer fin here, um, you can see its overall length and shape. And we'll look at the overall temperature distribution through that fin. Um, and again, we're going to go much more in depth in this. All right, so we will represent the uh, spatial variation right, of the unknown variable. So temperature, temperature is what's changing throughout our uh, fin here. And we're going to do it with the following functions. We'll have a linear function we'll look at, we'll look at quadratic function, and we'll look at a cubic function. And uh, we're also going to look at coordinate systems and how we can uh, model this for different coordinate systems, as well as special elements called isoparametric. All right, so let's get into this. All right, so the fin temperature profile looks like this. And so we have, obviously, our fins down here, comes out from a base. And we have, we can break it up into different elements along the way. Sorry, different nodes, and then from those nodes create different elements. And um, yeah, so just the overall shape of what we're looking at here. So again, base over here is going to have a certain base temperature that we start at, and there's going to be some fluid temperature that uh, flows across our fin. All right, so let's work uh, here now just at linear elements. So we got uh, basically mx plus b, or in this case, uh, ax plus b. All right, so looking at the fin, we're going to approximate the temperature distribution with linear elements. So the actual profile is down here. We have it actually gets curved temperature profiles moved down here. But if we do linear elements, you can see how it breaks up. And we actually have this gap here uh, in the resolution of what's actually happening in the temperature distribution as we move along uh, the fin from the base out to the edge. Now, down here where it's a little bit more linear, it's not quite as bad for element two and element three. But that first element, it's not that, not that good. So one way we can work on this is we can have more elements. Uh, more elements is, is more accuracy, uh, but it also takes us more time. Uh, not just us if we're doing calculations by hand, but also if the computer's doing calculations. And if it's if it's a relatively small amount more, then we won't notice it, but as we get to bigger models, it will matter. But you can see as we look at the model over here, uh, we do have a gap here where it's a really, really large curve. But as we get here, uh, again, it's a relatively linear profile just between those two nodes, so it's not nearly as bad. Right? So overall, elements don't need to be the same length. So when we have this relatively strong gradient, large curve that's happening in this area versus down here where it's relatively flat, we could just bunch in a bunch of nodes and elements in this area and then have less in this area. And that's one um, thing we'll look at as we get further in this course uh, as a nice strategy to help deal with and make sure we're seeing the, seeing the full picture of what we're analyzing. All right, so let's focus in now here a little bit more on the linear element. Again, mx plus b, or we have our two coefficients, c1 and c2, for our uh, linear line. And so if we're looking at our element here, we got uh, ti here and tj, so that we know the temperature is at the nodes at either end of our element. And position-wise, we go from xi to xj, and it's some length l. So the boundary conditions we have are is the temperature um, at node i, we know that, that's at uh, xi, and we know the temperature uh, t sub j at position x sub j. So use those, using those, we can solve for c1 and c2. So let's do that. Um, so kind of do that, kind of hand wave it, well, well, hopefully you can do the math for that. Um, so we're going to substitute those boundary conditions in the equation to solve for c1, c2. And we plug those back into our equation. And so we get our uh, C1s here. And we get C2 here. And now we're going to solve for, uh, or, or locate, rearrange, so we get uh, Ti by itself and Tj by itself. And hopefully you're seeing a trend here from what we've done before with axial elements. Uh, if we look up and we combine these terms, this guy, whoop, let me do that. this term and this term, we get our shape functions. All right, so shape functions are back here. And noting that the, the denominator here, xj minus xi, is really just L. We'll substitute in for that to clean things up a bit. All right, so we get our shape functions for linear elements. 
So um, the overall function or the overall equation for our temperature in the element is the shape function at node i times the temperature at node i and the shape function at node j times the temperature at node j. So in matrix form, relatively simple, right? SI, uh, shape function node I, shape function node J, temperature node I, temperature node J. If you hear the beeping sound, there's a, someone backing up here in the space behind me. Um, notice how this whole derivation is analogous to axial elements. We kind of hinted at that. You know, we, we're doing this linear uh, element. So very similar to what we do with axial elements. So, but let's generalize this. So we looked at the, using the temperature here, but you know, we could do this with anything. We could do this with deflection, we can do this with velocity. And so we can assume an unknown variable, psi, and we'll put that in. And so psi is equal to c1 plus c2 times x. And you can just imagine it's the same shape functions as what we had for the temperature. And we're gonna have the same matrix set up there as well for, for our psi value. So again, we can replace psi with temperature. So we could have temperature here. We could have deflection here. We could have velocity here. Right? Any of those could be that psi variable. All right, and we'll do some of this as we as we move along through. So that's the beauty of what we're doing right now, and we'll come back to this in a bit. All right, so let's look at the properties now of these shape functions. So we've talked a little about this before. Again, they're, even now they're seem a little bit trivial, but they'll be very useful later. So each shape function has a value of one at its corresponding node. So the shape function for node i is 1 at position i, at position node i, and the shape function node j is 1 at its position node j. And if you can remember from before, if we go to another node that isn't that node, so it has a value of 0 at its adjacent node. So if we're at uh, shape function node i is 0 at j, and the shape function node j is 0 at node i. All right. now again, we're going to repeat this with the other uh, functions we're going to look at here. Uh, if we add up all the shape functions, when added, they equal to 1. So we got si plus sj is equal to 1. For linear shape functions only, so, so just for linear shape functions, the sum of the derivatives with respect to x is 0. All right. So we can see that here. Oops, sorry. Some of those derivatives equal to 0. All right, so those are the properties of our shape functions here. So let's move now to quadratic elements. So we just looked at linear elements, moving on to quadratic elements. So uh, ax squared plus bx plus c. So the accuracy now of our finite element model can be increased via two different methods. All right, we already looked at the one. We said we can increase the number of linear elements, or, or elements in general. We can increase the number of elements. Um, but we can also use a higher order approximating function. So instead of a linear element, we can use a quadratic element. All right, so let's look at the heat transfer fin again, and we're going to look at the temperature distribution using quadratic elements. So 1D, 1D quadratic elements require three nodes to define the element. So we need three boundary conditions for the three unknown coefficients. So let's look at that here. So here's our fin. So we have uh, element one. Is made up of node 1, 2, and 3. And element 2 is made up of node 2, or 3, 4, and 5. So obviously they share node 3. And they're both made up of three nodes. So here's our quadratic element. And again, so we have position i, or node i, j, and k. k goes in the middle. So we still maintain i and j's position at the either end. And k is the node we now call and we put that one in the middle. And so now you can see how it helps to define that temperature distribution a little bit better. Um, instead of using linear elements, we have this quadratic element. All right, so node k is located in the middle of the element. And k is, yeah, so k is located in the middle. So we do have L over 2 here, uh, not just some random values. It's actually L over 2, so one half the length. All right, so we're going to approximate the temperature as a quadratic function. We have our boundary conditions. We know the temperature at node i. So position in J at J, and we know temperature in node K at K. So solving uh, for those, we're going to substitute and uh, solve those simultaneously so we get uh, what our uh, values are. And then if we rearrange for TI, TJ, and TK, you can imagine what's inside the brackets there. Yep, those are our shape functions. All right, so there's our shape functions for node I, J, and K. And we can have them in our function there. 
and they look the same in matrix form now instead of a uh, one by two it's uh, for linear functions now we got a one by three for shape functions all right so let's generalize we do the same thing we did for linear elements so again we're going to uh, use psi here and we got our quadratic equation we substitute in for our shape functions all right and we can have again this could be temperature this could be displacement and this or this could be velocity as well as others so again the beauty of this is it can generalize to other um, areas that we want to analyze all right so let's look at the shape functions at each node uh, we say at node 1, the shape function at node 1 is 1 at node 1, sorry. <laughs> shape function at node i is 1 at that location. Shape function for node j is 1 at node j. And shape function for node k is 1 at node k. All right. Likewise, everywhere else, it's 0. So the shape function node i is 0 at j and k and I'll skip down here shape function for node k is zero at nodes i and j all right and then if we add up all the shape functions we get they're all equal to one all right so hopefully that uh, makes some sense here as we're repeating now again linear remember the linear elements have the also the, the differential with respect to x again that was just linear elements not for quadratic here 